Well, good morning, church. Man, it's a good day already, isn't it? There's nothing better than watching people enter into new life through baptistry, man. Woo! I'm excited for that. Yeah. And for celebrating. So at age six, Ryan Kaji became the youngest person ever on a Forbes top earners list. He was raking in $11 million as his parents were posting his cute little toy critiques to YouTube. And now a few years later, at age 11, he's starting to age out of the toy stage, and he's pivoted his YouTube channel to do more DIY science and doodles and other things like that. And he's making about $30 million. 11 years old, $30 million. Show of hands, how many people babysat, mowed lawns, or had to pay for a route when you were a kid? Just doesn't seem fair, does it? <laughs> Just not right. Now, <clears throat> recent research has shown that of kids in America, middle school and high school age kids, at least 65% of them have said that for a career, they want to be an influencer. And most of those have said a social media influencer. Not sure what that says about us as a nation and where we're going or exactly what that means, but we know that there's a lot of people who are wanting to influence others. And today we begin week 12 of Mark Moore's Quest 52. Um, and we're using this as our devotional guide to guide us in a year-long pursuit of Jesus. If you're new to us or newer to us and you haven't picked up a copy, we have some available out in the lobby. You can grab one after the service. We encourage you to purchase a few to share with friends as well. And if you are new to us or maybe you've been with us but you've kind of fallen off of the study for a bit, we're getting ready to start week 12. This is week 12, so just jump in where we are. Don't worry about those first 11 weeks. Just jump in on week 12 and join us where we are. And the key question in week 12 is this. What's it take to be an influencer for Jesus? What's it take to be an influencer for Jesus? And to answer that question, we're going to listen into a conversation that Jesus had with a guy named Nicodemus. In John chapter 3, perhaps the most famous passage of the Bible. There was a man named Nicodemus, a Jewish religious leader who was a Pharisee. Now, Nicodemus was a member of the Sanhedrin, the Jewish religious council, the leading council. And so he was a member of the highest religious group there was at that time for the Jewish people. And Nicodemus came to Jesus one time after dark, and he said to Jesus, Rabbi, we all know that God has sent you to teach us. Your miraculous signs are evidence that God is with you. Now, Nicodemus came to Jesus at night, and that was not abnormal for Pharisees or, or religious leaders to gather at night. They would often get together to discuss religious matters after dark, away from the crowds that would follow them, away from the entourage of students and other people gathered around. It was often so they could have a private conversation without everyone else listening in. Now, this looked a little different. Last week, we talked about a religious gathering at night, but that was more of a, a show or spectacle, a big dinner party. This is just a more common practice where one rabbi would approach another to ask questions and dialogue out of respect for each other. And Nicodemus undoubtedly saw himself as the higher social status person in that conversation. And he feared that if he approached Jesus during the day when everybody else was listening in, that if Jesus were to answer a question incorrectly, really shows that Nicodemus didn't know who he was talking to, but if Jesus were to answer incorrectly, that might discredit Jesus, or that Jesus might discredit Nicodemus. So he showed Jesus great respect, came to him at night, even called him rabbi, that he is a heaven-sent teacher because of all the signs and miracles he was doing. Now, Jesus had already performed some signs, already performed some miracles, but his ministry was in its infancy. He was just getting started at this point. But Nicodemus comes with an attitude of, hey, you know, I've got a pretty big platform, I'm a pretty big deal, and you get me in your corner, that's a pretty big advantage for you, Jesus. And then Jesus spins the whole conversation in a different direction. Jesus says to him, I tell you the truth, Nicodemus, unless you are born again, you cannot see the kingdom of God. And this phrase, born again, can also be translated born from above. And I think that the double meaning is very intentional here. Born from above, born from heaven, or born again. 
Well, Nicodemus exclaims, what do you mean? How can an old man go back into his mother's womb and be born again? Legit question, don't think too long on that. (laughs) And Jesus replies to him, I assure you, no one can enter the kingdom of God without being born of water and the spirit. Humans can reproduce only human life, but the Holy Spirit gives birth to spiritual life. So don't be surprised when I say you must be born again, born from above. For the wind blows wherever it wants. Just as you can hear the wind, but you can't tell where it comes from or where it is going, so you cannot explain how people are born of the Spirit. Now, the Greek word for wind is the same word for spirit. It's one of my favorite Greek words, pneuma, pneuma. And what a beautiful double meaning, that the Spirit moves like the wind, The Spirit acts as the wind. And our job is not to understand where it comes from, where it goes, how it moves. Our job is to simply follow, to surrender to the Spirit, to follow the Spirit's leading. Our job is to set our spiritual sails high and catch the Spirit wind and go where it blows. And being part of God's kingdom, Jesus says, requires being born twice. That there's an element here of following where he goes, and it's being born twice. The first birth is to be born in the flesh. We all did pretty good with that, right? You're here today, you're breathing, you're alive. Look at your neighbor and say, congrats, you got the first half done. Like, legit, look at him and say, good job. <laughs> like, that part, now, I don't know if that was easy. We've just all blocked that out of our memory. But we got that part done. The second birth is the spiritual birth. And this is the one that saves us. This is the birth that allows us to experience the grace, the power, and the redemption of God in our lives. And that is what saves us. Not what we do, but receiving what God has done for us. And this spiritual birth is a reference to baptism. This being born of the Spirit is to be born in baptism. And it's not just a ceremonial cleansing. What we witnessed a couple minutes ago with those two gals surrendering their life to Jesus, that's not just ceremony. That's not just a religious cleansing. That's not just some symbolic act. That's an actual, real surrender, and that's an actual, real death. When we are surrendered in the water of baptism, there is a real spiritual death that happens, and a new you is born. There's a transference, an eternal transference that happens in that moment. It's a collision of the divine and the human, of the supernatural and the natural. We're somehow beyond, as Jesus says, beyond what we can explain. There's something that happens in that moment. And our old spiritual self is dead and a new you is born. And what a beautiful thing that is. So, Nicodemus asked Jesus, well, how are these things possible? And I love that question because it follows immediately on the heels of Jesus saying, you won't be able to explain it. You can't understand it. Well, then explain it to me, says Nicodemus. Jesus replies to him, you, Nicodemus, are a respected Jewish teacher, and yet you don't understand these things? I assure you, we tell you what we know and have seen, and yet you won't believe our testimony. So how is it, if you don't believe me when I tell you about earthly things, how can you possibly believe if I tell you about heavenly things? No one has ever gone to heaven and returned, but the Son of Man, and that's one of Jesus' favorite ways to refer to himself. That's one of his favorite titles for himself. The Son of Man has come down from heaven to earth. And as Moses lifted up the bronze snake on a pole in the wilderness... So the Son of Man must be lifted up so that everyone who believes in him will have eternal life. Now this snake on a pole is a reference to what happened. It's recorded for us in the Old Testament book of Numbers chapter 21. God had rescued his people, the Israelites, from their slavery, their captivity in Egypt. And he was leading them to the promised land. But along the way, It wasn't just like, we're out of Egypt, we're in the promised land, oh, that's great. It's kind of like traveling 
from here to Colorado. And if you gotta go through Kansas, you know part of that trip is just not so great. You gotta get through Kansas. So what happens when kids are traveling through Kansas? They start grumbling, they start complaining, they start rebelling. Are we there yet? What's taking so long? We should have just stayed at home. This car ride is long, this is terrible, it's all flat. Kansas is boring. Just wait till we get to Colorado, it'll be so much better. But you gotta get through it, right? It was the same way for the Israelites. They're trekking through and they're grumbling, they're complaining, they're throwing a fit against God because they aren't too excited about the journey from and the journey to. They just wanna be there right away. So God sends snakes, vipers to punish them. He sends these things, they bite the people. And then he tells Moses, craft a snake and put it on a pole, hold it up, and whoever looks upon the snake, whoever gazes upon it, will be healed. Now there's mystery, there's a little confusion, that's kind of a, a different kind of story, but that's what Jesus is referring to there. And he says, in the same way, the Son of Man, he's referring to himself, the Son must be lifted on a pole, and whoever gazes at him, fixing their eyes on him, believing in him, will be healed, will be saved, will have eternal life. Now friends, I just wanna address that statement that Jesus made, that there are things that we can't explain, things we won't understand. That's one of the first principles in studying the Bible that we need to just grab onto. Humility. Humility to acknowledge that there are things of God that are beyond our comprehension. And that's not a bad thing, that God is so big we can't fully comprehend who he is, how he works, what he's done. That he has done things, he operates in a way, he is in a way beyond what we can fully grasp. And so there is mystery with God and there must be humility with us. We should believe firmly what we believe about God, but we should hold loosely some of our dogma, some of our, our religious convictions, trusting that God is at work in that. But here's the beautiful thing. The things that we need to know most, there is no mystery. God has made it plain, he has made it clear. The things that we need for salvation, the pathway of salvation, who God is, what he's done, and how he loves us, and how we can enter into relationship for eternity with him is as clear as day, as plain as day. There is no mystery, there's no confusion with that. And we need to be humble because of what he's done, because we could not do it ourselves. But we need not to be swayed that anyone besides Jesus can save us. Jesus says the key to understanding who he is is to gaze upon him, to look at him and know that he is the son of man who must be crucified and exalted as both savior and Lord. I like how Anthony said it a minute ago, that Jesus is the boss of our life and we must surrender to that. Now what comes next in their conversation is probably the most well-known Bible verse in all of the Bible, John three sixteen, And Friends, I'm gonna ask you to read this one with me. For this is how God loved the world. He gave his one and only son so that everyone who believes in him will not perish but have eternal life. Probably heard that before. And here's the danger. The more familiar something becomes to us, sometimes in its familiarity, it loses its power. It loses its beauty, it loses its authority, it loses its magnitude. So don't allow the familiarity of this verse to cause you to lose sight of all the eternal significance contained therein. God loved us, each and every one of us, so much that he sent his son to save us so that if you believe in him as Lord, as Savior, you won't go to hell. You'll join him in heaven for eternity. And that is the crux of life. That's so beautiful, that's so powerful. Don't let its familiarity cause you to miss the beauty and the power of it. Now Jesus immediately repeats this phrase again. Uh, it has repeated this phrase again when he says, right? And that's one of the things, as we read the Bible, as we study the Bible, repetition is a key to understanding importance. When, when things are repeated again and again, it, it tells us that that's an important thing. They're signaling to it, we should pay attention. And the closer they are in proximity and repetition, they're important. And so Jesus has just said this same thing. Go back a verse for me, if you will. 
He said, whoever believes won't perish but have eternal life. And so it tells us that's a pretty important thing. He's signifying something really important. And then he goes on to say this. God sent his son into the world not to judge the world, but to save the world through him. There is no judgment against anyone who believes in him. But anyone who does not believe in him has already been judged for not believing in God's one and only son. And the judgment is based on this fact. God's light came into the world, but people loved the darkness more than the light, for their actions were evil. And all who do evil hate the light and refuse to go near it for fear their sins will be exposed. We understand that, we get that. When we're doing something wrong, when we know that we're doing wrong, we don't want anybody to shine the light on that. We don't want them to see the wrong or tell us that what we're doing is wrong. We wanna hide. And that's what Jesus is saying. But he says all those who do what is right, they come to the light so that others can see that they are doing what God wants. Now, I'm not often a fan of dichotomies because usually... I think they're false. Usually, I think situations are way more nuanced than just a simple black or white response. There's a whole lot of gray matter in between. But there are times when a dichotomy is exactly right, when there are only two options, and this is one of those times. There are only two options, there's no middle ground. You're either in or you're out with Jesus. And if you're only partly in, you're out. You're not really in. You either believe or you reject, you follow or you deny. There is no middle ground with Jesus. And so he gives us the choice. Will we be in or will we be out? Will we follow and believe or reject and deny? And the choice is yours to make, friend. I mentioned a moment ago that repetition is a method of demonstrating importance. That They didn't have, at the time the New Testament was written, they, they didn't have things like, well, we'll underline it for importance, or we'll italicize it, or we'll highlight it with different colors, or do something like that. That just wasn't part of what they had. But they used repetition a lot. And, and parents get this, right? Like, parents know. We repeat ourselves all the time, right? How many parents have said something to your children more than once, right? Uh, like, you know, you, you've probably used some version of this. If I've told you once, I've told you a thousand times. Last service, somebody said a million times. They really upped the ante on that one. <laughs> but we know, right? My kids can probably tell you the things. I can begin a statement. They will finish it for me. Dad, I know you've said it before. Great. Why aren't you doing it, knucklehead? Right? Like, you've heard me say it. You know what you're supposed to do. And God is like that with us. And he repeats things all the time in scripture. And if you were to read through the gospel of John, I encourage you to do that. Read through John's gospel, you'll find the word belief shows up dozens upon dozens of times. In fact, in this passage, the word believe or belief, some version of that shows up eight times just in the small passage we're looking at today. And so when things are repeated that much, it signals to us, man, that's a pretty important thing. So friend, here's the deal. Belief is a very important thing. And John's gospel may be the most important thing. So let me ask you the most important question you'll ever be asked. What do you believe about Jesus? See, your eternity hangs in the balance of your response to that question. How you answer that most important question will be the most important answer you ever give. Do you believe Jesus was a good moral example, a really nice guy, a pretty fantastic teacher, a good spiritual leader, He was all those things, he just was way more than that. Do you believe he was king of the universe, lord of lords, that he is your savior and the leader of your life? See friend, your answer is the most important answer you'll ever give to any question. And if you cannot say that Jesus is both savior and king in your life, I wanna encourage you to look again into who Jesus is and to reevaluate your answer to that question because there is only one right answer for your eternity. You know, Nicodemus first approached Jesus with curiosity. He came to him at night, he was asking some questions. We know you're a teacher, you're heaven sent, you're doing all these miracles, but who are you? What's all this about? He was, he was leaning into Jesus with curiosity. But Jesus was just getting started in his ministry at that point. And over the next year, Jesus continued to perform more signs and miracles. And this really got in the crawl of the religious leaders, the other people like Nicodemus, because the religious leaders 
stake their power and their authority on their religious system. Because for them, it was a whole system of the, the more good you do, the gooder you are, because that's good grammar, right? The gooder you are, the closer you are to God. They were a bunch of do-gooders, and the ones who do-gooded the best, I'm, I'm just nailing it today, ones who were the best, they got closest to God, right? And, and so they were the bunch of do-gooders who sat at the top of the spectrum, but Jesus comes on and he flips that, and it's like, you can't do good enough. You can't be good enough to get to God. It's God coming to you. That's his whole thing. The Son came out of heaven to us. That's what Jesus was pointing at. It's about belief in the Son. And it's belief, not works. It's about what God has done for us, not what we can do for ourselves. And so Jesus has flipped this script and he continues to do it. And it just is bugging the religious leaders because not only is he challenging the religious system, but in doing so, he's challenging their their social power, their authority. He's upending it. He's causing people to question the religious leaders, to turn from them and to follow him. So he's created this stir. So about a year after the first conversation that good old Nicodemus has with Jesus, we encounter this other instance in John chapter seven, where the religious leaders, the Pharisees, they send a group called the Temple Guard, which is just a small religious army, to go arrest Jesus so they can detain him and question him and hopefully lock him up or get rid of him somehow. So they send the temple guard out, and we catch what happens here in John 7. When the temple guard returned without having arrested Jesus, uh uh-oh, the leading priests and Pharisees demanded, why didn't you bring him in? You had one job. Go get Jesus. You went to where he was teaching. You come back empty-handed. Where's Jesus? And the guys responded, we have never heard anyone speak like that. Now, keep in mind who they're talking to. They're talking to the religious leaders, the priests, the Pharisees, the preachers of their day. They're talking to a whole lot of Fitzes saying, that dude's a way better preacher than you are. We ain't never heard anybody communicate like that. Listen, man, we're not following you. That guy's good. Have you heard what he says? Have you heard how good he is? Have you seen what he's done? Jesus is good. We don't want to arrest him. Like, we were amazed. Like, it's a slap in the face against the guy. These are the the army guards sent to arrest him, and they're like, "Uh, no, we kind of like him. So their response, have you been led astray also, the Pharisees mocked? Mocked. They were the ones being mocked. (laughs) I love it. So is there a single one of us rulers or Pharisees who believes in him? This foolish crowd follows him, but they are ignorant of the law. God's curse is on them. Oh, little did they know they were so wrong. Then Nicodemus, the leader who had met with Jesus earlier, spoke up. Is it legal to convict a man before he's given a hearing, he asked. Nicodemus speaks up. He speaks out. He stood up for Jesus. He questioned the groupthink mentality of let's go get this guy and hit pause and said, hold on. We might want to take a look at who Jesus is, what he's saying, what he's doing. Nicodemus defended Jesus in that moment. He challenged the others. He stood up, took a stance, but his boldness had limits. And when the other Pharisees challenged him, he stepped back towards the dark. They replied to him, are you from Galilee too, Nicodemus? Search the scriptures and see for yourself. No prophet ever comes from Galilee. They just didn't understand the whole story, the whole picture. Now we see Jesus, or sorry, we see Nicodemus show up a third time in John's gospel. The third time is immediately after the crucifixion. We pick it up in John 19. After the crucifixion, Joseph of Arimathea who had been a secret disciple of Jesus because he feared the Jewish leaders, he asked Pilate for permission to take down Jesus' body. Now, what often would happen is after a crucifixion, the bodies were left up on display for days when eventually servants or Roman guards would take the bodies down. They would throw them into the valley of Gehenna where dogs and other animals would come Ravage and savage the bodies. But here, Joseph asks for the body. Now, you could bribe the Roman officials for the body, but it appears no bribery was needed because Pilate just gave permission. So Joseph came and he took the body away. But with him came Nicodemus, the man who had come to Jesus at night. Joseph had been a secret disciple. Nicodemus seems to have been 
secretive in his following, but all that is changing. Nicodemus brought about 75 pounds of perfumed ointment made from myrrh and aloes. Now historians will tell us that in today's dollars, the equivalent of that is he brought about $100,000 worth of spices to honor Jesus. It's a pretty big deal. That's not something you do if you're not in. So we continue on. Following, Jesus bar- or following Jewish burial custom, they wrapped Jesus' body with the spices and long sheets of linen cloth. And the place of crucifixion was near a garden where there was a new tomb that had never been used before. And so because it was the day of preparation for the Jewish Passover, and since the tomb was close at hand, they laid Jesus there. Now you gotta understand, Passover, that is the biggest deal on the Jewish calendar, especially for a man like Nicodemus, uh, a leading Pharisee, a leading religious teacher, a member of the Sanhedrin. He's at the top of the game. I mean, this is like an NCAA official at March Madness time, right? I mean, this is, this is a big deal, right? Like, this is, this is the thing of the year. And so here he is, but Nicodemus touches a dead body, which immediately defiles him, which means he's unclean, And because he's unclean, he's unable to participate in the Passover celebration. Nicodemus could not have kept this secret. Going to the body to remove the body would have happened during the daytime. There's no way he is a secretive follower anymore. Taking down the body, being absent from the religious celebration and festivals and rituals as a member of the Sanhedrin. His absence would have been noted by every other member of the Sanhedrin. Nicodemus had once stood in secret, but now he takes a stance and he says, I'm with that guy. I'm putting my money, my reputation, I'm putting all of it with Jesus. And notice this is before the resurrection. He just knows there's something special and something's coming. I don't know what it is, but I know that guy deserves my allegiance. I'm with him. And in that moment, Nicodemus is identified by the others undoubtedly as a follower, as a disciple. See, John says Joseph had been a secret disciple. Nicodemus had been with him in secret, but now they're public, now they're out, and now they're in the light. See, there's really no such thing as a secret disciple. You just can't be, it's an oxymoron, it doesn't happen. See, our faith, friends, is always personal, but it's never private. We are called not just to Christ himself, but to his community of believers, the church. It's why I always kind of chuckle and confuse when someone says, oh, that guy, that gal, they're a fantastic Christian, they just don't go to church. You don't go to church, you are the church. But as the church, you gather with the church. And if you're not gathering with the church, you're kind of missing the point of what it is to be the church. See, the church comes together, we are the gathering, so that we then go out and share with those who aren't yet here. We're inviting them to the family. See, a personal relationship always requires a public proclamation. Devotion and discipleship to Jesus is marked by our declaration, by letting the world know. See, when Nicodemus first came to Jesus, he was reluctant to declare his allegiance. Feared maybe that that might discredit Jesus, but he also feared it might discredit him. It might cost him some authority, might cost him some power, might cost him some reputation points. He might lose position. He was a man of influence and he might lose influence. These days, influence is big, right? Everybody wants to be an influencer, which really means people want to get famous. They wanna get wealthy and get known for getting noticed for somebody getting it on video. That's how so much influence happens. You just get it on video, five seconds of something and it goes viral and everybody knows and all of a sudden you get to share your opinion with everybody. So in a culture, in a day and age where anyone and everyone wants to be an influencer and everyone has an opinion on everything, church, here's our mission. Let's do everything we can to influence everyone we can to find and follow Jesus. So you don't need a big platform. You don't need a lofty religious degree. You don't need a title. You don't need the education, you don't need fame, status, money to be used by God. Those things aren't bad, those things certainly are not evil, those things just are not necessary to be used by God. To be an influencer for Jesus, you need two things. You need a surrendered heart and a willingness 
to leverage whatever you have for his glory, his fame, his kingdom, not yours. You need to be surrendered to him, acknowledging that he is savior and he is the boss in your life and a willingness to take whatever you have to make Jesus famous in your life. See, to be an influencer for Jesus, you don't have to have influence or platform or position. Those things are not required to be used by God. But God does require us to use whatever platform we have, no matter how big or how small it is, for his glory and his fame to point people to him. That's our mission. Nicodemus approached Jesus in the darkness of night, but Jesus spoke to him of a spiritual darkness that was pervasive. And Jesus returned to that theme of light again and again and again during his ministry. And returned to it again towards the end of his ministry, just days before his crucifixion. John records to us that there were many who were following Jesus secretively. Even amongst the Pharisees and the religious leaders, they followed him but in secret. Why? Because they enjoyed the praise of people more than the praise of God. And they didn't want to sacrifice their own reputation. And so into that, Jesus spoke this. He said, I'm here to bring light in this world, freeing whom? Everyone who believes in me from the darkness that blinds them. Jesus came to free everyone, everyone. That includes you and me and everyone else. And friend, as his, as his followers, his mission becomes our mission. And that means we live our lives on a rescue mission for others. We live our lives to shine his light into the darkness of this world. And it's not enough for us to privately receive the light. We must be willing to share the light with others. We must be beacons of light, beacons of hope to people who have no light, who have no hope, who are in desperate need of it. See, if we believe, then our lives should shine it. So friend, let me ask, Who's your one? Who's the one person who needs you to shine light into their darkness? Who's the one person in your circle of influence wandering in the dark who needs the light of hope that you have? Who is the one that you know who is not ready for their last day on this planet because they'll face an eternity of darkness? Who's your one who needs to see the light of hope that you alone can shine into their world? Who's your one? And here's my challenge. Let's all pray specifically for our one. Pray for the courage to share with him. Pray that God would give us a winsomeness to share with him. That we don't share arrogantly, but we share boldly, confidently, but kindly. That, that we would pray that God would move them from curiosity like Nicodemus began to the confidence he had when he showed up at the cross. Let, let's pray for those people. And, and let's make sure we talk to God about that person before we talk to that person about God. But let's not end there. After we talk to God about the person, let's go talk to the person about God and let's invite boldly, winsomely, but boldly. Let's invite them. Pray first and then invite. I mean, what if we all invited just one to join us, to join us at a Sunday service, to join us at, at Rooted, to participate in Rooted with us? Damn, I'm Rooted, folks. You get excited. Well, what if we invited our one to just join us in studying Quest 52 this year? What if we invited them to join us in an Easter service? and said, come, join me. And you know, I just wonder what God would do if we were all willing to invite just one. How many people might find the light as a result of that? And I know that, you know, sometimes people might not respond well. They, they might say no. But most people, even when they say no, they're gonna say it politely. No thanks, really not interested in going to your church. Okay. There might be some who are like, oh, you're one of those people? Oh, great. You know what, that, that just sets you up to break the stereotype and show them that no, you're not one of those people. You're one of those people that loves them, that desires to help them find grace and mercy and kindness. See, the worst that can happen is they say no. So let's make sure we're not like those secretive people who put more stake in the praise of people than the praise of God. But let's winsomely, boldly, lovingly invite others. And, and their response is not our responsibility. Your response when you share the light with them is simply to share the light, to share your hope in the power of the Holy Spirit and to trust those results to God. How they respond is between them and God. Unless you're a jerk, then you gotta take some ownership in that, right? Like if, if you don't do it well, but if you lovingly, kindly share, the response is between them and God. And so, friend, I wanna invite you. If you're willing 
to pray specifically and regularly for your one, and you're willing to boldly, winsomely invite your one to join you, to be a light in the darkness of this world, then in just a moment, we're gonna sing a song, and I wanna invite you during that song to come forward and to take one of the bulbs from one of these trays and to place your bulb, you'll twist it into the receptacle. They're not just push ones, you gotta twist it in. And you can see first service did it. If you're willing to pray, if you're willing to invite, then come forward and place the bulb as, just as a, a metaphor, right? As a, an example of your willingness. Not of their response, but of your willingness. And maybe you're here and you have never stepped into the light before. You're here and and you came curious like Nicodemus began. But you want the confidence that he had at the end to know that you would go all in with Jesus, even staking your reputation on it, to be outed as one of his followers. When I invite you during that song, when you come forward and you place the the bulb, that bulb represents you. That that bulb's for you. And you say, I'm ready to go all in. And and we'll have some of our our church leaders available on each side to pray for you, to counsel you. If you've got questions about what it looks like to step out of the darkness and into the light, we'd love to have that conversation with you. So church, when we we do this, there shouldn't be anyone still in their seat. Every person here willing to invite, willing to pray, or willing to say, man, I'm, I'm wanting to go all in with him. And that includes those of you in the balcony during that song. You can make your way down the stairs on the side and come over. And, and we've got plenty of bulbs, plenty of space. So uh, sometimes it gets a little crowded on the sides. You can just make your way into the center. There's eight letters. I think if I, I'm a preacher, not a mathematician. I think there's eight letters here. So plenty of spots for several of you at the same time to do this. But then don't leave. Make your way back to your seat because we're not quite done yet. But I'm going to invite you right now to go ahead and stand as we pray. And then come forward as we sing and place the bulb for your one right here. Now, we have not plugged this in yet because we didn't want it to blind you. And it's really low voltage, but on a crazy, we don't want it to shock anybody either. So it'll get lit up and this will make its way into a prominent place in our church as a regular reminder of how God came for everyone and how he sends us to everyone. But also that that means he's for each one of us. Listen, friend, you need to know Jesus is for everyone. But even if you were the only one, he still would have done everything he did just for you. Let's pray. God, we thank you that you are the God of grace and mercy. And God, in this moment, we ask that you would give us your Holy Spirit courage to shine your light the light of hope that you've given to us into this dark world. God, we pray that you, would, that you would lead us to do it boldly with confidence, but winsomely with love. That we would choose the praise of you over the praise of people, staking our reputation on you. God, that we would seek to do whatever we can, as often as we can, to make you famous. That we would not be about our own kingdoms influencing people for us, but we would be about influencing them for you. And God, if there are any joining us now in this moment, in person, online, who are are standing in the dark, who came curious, but they're ready to be confident in their walk with you. God, I pray that you give them the courage to come forward and to proclaim that today is their day to go all in with you. God, that we would all answer that question of what we believe about Jesus. That we would answer that he is our Lord. He is our Savior. He is our friend, our Redeemer. He is your Son and our Savior. And we pray this for your glory and yours alone. 